Okay, I'll start talking. Uh, I don't know why it shows 20 minutes, but I won't do it in 20 minutes. So uh, I know that it's last session. It's the most unforgiving session because I'm the only thing that stands between you and beer that's going to be downstairs. I'll try to get through the topic quite fast, but if I cannot do it, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, first, two rules about the talk. The talk is a uh, soft topic. It's, it's, it doesn't have any code. So remember about it. And first rule, if you got any questions, I don't mind being interrupted. Just raise your hand, shout, out, shout it out if I don't see that, and let's have it all cleared. Second rule, uh, if you won't find this topic particularly interesting for you, relevant for whatever you're doing, uh, not if you'll find during the talk that someone else is doing something better, is that a question? No. Uh, then I don't mind if you leave. I, I will be talking even if I'm the last person in the room, because just assume that I like to listen to my own voice. <sighs> last thing, this talk is not about me. Uh, it may look as it's being about me mm, on different occasions, as I'll try to take a lot of situations and put myself into them. Uh, Regardless of that, try, and I will try also to explain how the situation may, may be relevant for you. But yeah, uh, I, I usually don't talk about myself. The contact information will sh uh, show up also at the very, very end, so uh, don't worry about it. And let's start first from explaining to you why the heck that guy, or rather that guy, is suitable for you to explaining why working with others matter, and how can we do it more effe effe <coughs> efficiently, damn it. Okay, so what you can see in here is me doing pure fact function reactive programming, uh, which means that I'm doing Excel during the fire drill alarm, because, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a geek on that machine, because I love that computer, even though it's Samsung and it's stupid, but. So, uh, I'm into passing my knowledge uh, and learning and teaching others and learning myself for a very long time. I started on Twitter, followed shortly uh, with my blog, which is right now dead. Uh, I was coding for the better part of my life. So I was mostly tweeting and blogging about it, uh, various topics, web frameworks, Java, stuff like that. Then I started to go for Java user group in Free City. Uh, right now, I'm lead there. I'm helping others to find uh, the place to share the knowledge with. So yeah, sharing knowledge is a big part of my life. I think that anyone can do it, and I started from Zero followers on Twitter, zero readers. Probably I have zero readers right now and a couple of friends that are following me. So that doesn't really matter. You can start very, very, with very little expectations and go from there. Because from Jack, after giving a couple of talks, um, well, I went for conferences. And believe me or not, I'm here, so anyone can do it. Uh, despite the DevOps is great. But it's not so hard to go into the conference and share your knowledge. Just think about what you can share. And for many years, uh, a lot of speakers knew me mainly because I was talking about organizing a conference in the north, in Free City. So last year, we were able to do it. We organized Geekon Microservices, conference dedicated to microservices. This year, in September, we are doing conference about reactive programming, because it's a buzzword which we want to either kill or support. So if you're interested, you can do it. And yeah, I started with zero followers and went for co-organizing a conference, and all of that in a couple of years. It's super simple, trust me. I'll try to show it during the course of the talk that it's possible for anyone and the means to do it. Uh, I don't think that it's particularly like anything amazing like, for example, Jegos is doing here on DevOx, where he started with a small event, local event, 33rd degree, where he get the great speakers and grew to 
this thing, <laughs> which is like totally awesome. But still, you can make a contribution on your uh, community. And let's start from basics, which will be why does it matter at all? Why, let's say, Myself, why do I care about teaching others and sharing knowledge and just building the community? So I started to ask that question to myself even for a long time. Uh, is that a question or just a way? Okay. So <laughs> I asked that question to myself. Uh, it's pretty looked like a question. So uh, to myself a long time ago and my thought was, okay, I'm going to all of the conferences, sitting there like you are doing that la this time at the moment, and looking at that guy that knows a lot about databases, about testing, writing clean code, thinking to myself, I would really want to work with that person. Why, why, cannot, ha uh, why cannot I have him in my team? What's really preventing me from getting him there? Well, obvious answer, he's probably from States or from different region in Poland or just wants to earn so much that, well, my company wouldn't hire him. So what can I do about it? So I started to think maybe I should start talking with the other people, but the other thing, why I even care about the people? And then I thought to myself, oh, that's the reason. I'm not longer, any longer a student that's sitting in the basement coding in the middle of the night, listening to the server and some trash metal. I'm, I'm working with people, a lot of people, because no software system being created in 2016, okay, maybe not all of them, but 90 couple percent of them won't be created by one person. And the people, in the process are very, very different-minded. And diversity, it's the simplest way to show it is that, yeah, we are diverse by gender. That's like super easy to prove, right? So uh, at the beginning of a year, while preparing that talk, while preparing to give the talk to anyone, I read a lot of papers and there are research where the uh, people from the university took 100% male teams and 100% female teams and measured the performance, how fast they will, were doing the tasks. And then suddenly they started to merge th those teams till they got a mix. And they were uh, checking on average how better or worse uh, a mixed team performed, and <laughs> I don't remember the number, I remember that significantly it was much better when you had mixed teams. Uh, this year, I rarely take vacations. I went to Japan finally, which was like my Neverland. I always wanted to go there, and I seen people in Japan, and they think in a totally different way. In Poland, for example, we are very oriented on heroes, like the Iconoclast, the guy that comes and tears down everything. We love those people. Out there, they wouldn't love that, that kind of a person at all. So uh, I haven't checked the papers, probably someone did it. I still think that there's something into that, that probably it matters if you will mix the team and take people from different country or region even. Or what happens when you will have people with different mindset and how to tell if they have a different mindset. And in my previous company, we were using a tool called Thomas PPE, uh, which is basically mm, a tool for HR people, for people that know how to work with people, not for me, not probably for many of you, if you haven't got the training, uh, which will tell you your personality type. There's like a lot of tools that do that. Uh, and I won't recommend to you to check each one of them or even try to apply them at work because there is some degree of expertise necessary. I know that we can do like anything because we are smart because we are developers. But what I would recommend, recommend to you is go online, check those tools. They got sample profiles and you read, just read what are the sample profiles of people that you can find there. Why? Because maybe you will understand that people are not motivated the very same way as you are. Some are motivated by money, some are motivated by something else, like uh, patting on the back from your friend. 
Some like to work on a feature from the beginning to the end. Some uh, want to work on a feature just in the design phase. So stuff like that matters, and people matter because we work with them. OK, what comes next? Uh, thing that I like to talk about, uh, I, I try to mention that in many of my talks. And uh, there are a couple of questions that you can ask to yourself. Those slides will be public, so you can go through them uh, on your own pace. Basically, if you feel that your achievements are maybe a sheer luck, that everything that you achieved in your life uh, is just a pure lie, that you're lying to other people, you have to show a different face to them. You don't show your real yourself. You're afraid to ask questions because maybe someone will discover that you're not as great then there's a thing called imposter syndrome. It's a psychological thing. Uh, I'm probably not the best person to explain it, because I'm not an expert in the field, but I read about it a lot. I watched a lot of presentations, and I like to share the knowledge that there's something like that exists. So what it is? It's so-called cognitive bias, which stands for, uh, basically, that very intelligent person that does a great job, that knows what he or she is doing, uh, basically is unable to recognize how good the person is, how good he he's himself. So, uh, for example, as a speaker, let's take it, for each year when I'm trying to go to conferences with a new talk, I'm always afraid. Hey. I, I'm going to be seen by like 60, 100 people or whatever. Someone will notice that I'm not after psychology and I shouldn't be talking about that. They will just think that I'm an idiot and no one will ever want to hire me. So there's like a huge risk in my head. And still, I do it. Uh, as a developer, for many years, I was thinking to myself, OK, I'm really rubbish each day. I, I get like a two, three buck. Uh, tickets in Jira, or I get like a dozen of stack traces, production blows up. Uh, I was hacking in the middle of the night uh, during the weekends in Veeam just to fix some JSP files because I botched them earlier. So yeah, I'm pretty terrible and still someone is paying to me for that. So okay, I probably did a decent job. And when I learned that there's something like imposter syndrome, I thought to myself immediately, maybe I just hoped that I can have it. OK, so I started to read more. And then I discovered that there's a second bias called Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, which basically stands for a very stupid person thinks that she's great. And we all know that a-hole. <laughs> you got him in your company or your team. That guy that puts a lot of bugs in the code that makes it untestable, stuff like that. So after being just so happy about it, yeah, there, there's that psychological thing. I'm not so stupid. I'm not so bad. I was killed. But yeah. Let's talk about how to recognize one and the other uh, in a minute. And first of all, uh, you're probably happy because you don't have it. I'm the only mm, imposter, uh, thiefy kind of a guy that's stealing your time because he doesn't know what he does in here. Uh, so how does it matter to you? Well, as we probably all, I hope that you trust me at least that much, seen, uh, the people are important for us. You either work with them, you got them at home, there's uh, many places where you can have them, so sorry. <laughs> okay, so it matters. And why? First of all, for the people with the syndrome, uh, it may be hard to change the job. Because you're thinking to yourself, OK, I'm, I'm in that company for 12 years. I know everyone. I know everything. I, I'm in my comfort zone. Uh, if no one will notice that I'm sitting behind the pillar somewhere in the open space, no one will ask me questions, and I will still contribute. I will have my job, right? So people with the imposter syndrome may stay at one workplace for a long time, and those may be your friends. So that's bad from that perspective. Or maybe you have an imposter architect in your team. Guess what? He knows Java EE 1.2 and uh, Java 
is uh, 1.4, and struts, one. So guess what's your next technology? Maybe your expert on insurance will see a new product and won't ask the obvious question for him at the very beginning because he will be afraid that he's going to be caught as an imposter. Because an expert, as an expert, he should know everything, right? <laughs> There's like not a chance that he doesn't understand something or doesn't know. Or he won't just raise the objection during the sprint that something is going wrong because he should be able to fix it. Or maybe it just matters because it's nice to help someone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm there to help. Okay, so you got it. Someone else got it. It matters. What next? Where, why does it uh, show up? Well, first of all, it's a psychological thing, so a lot of people get it. But what we can do to fight with it is to fight with stress. And we developers, other than being a lot of us are probably uh, introverts, we also get a lot of stress uh, at work. Why? Because we fail constantly. There's like a lot of evidence that we are doing a bad job. And even if we are being asked, hey, what is the way that you would want to work? What would be the perfect way in which you're working? We say, oh, we got the solution. First we fail, then we make the test go green, and then we refactor to fail again. Brilliant. By the way, TDD is great. Uh, I'm picking on it, but mm, yeah, because it's simple, but uh, it's great to use it. And it's as technical as this talk will go. So inside your environment, there's a lot of things that you can improve. Uh, you can teach people to have less failures, but in the environment, think about how your team is structured. How are you working? Are you a perfectionist? How does it influence the others when you're sitting for weeks on a one thing and they are churning them quickly and then failing? Uh, Things like, like job titles. Uh, how do you treat people with a different job title? If you got those juniors or regular developers or people at level three and you're level five, whatever that means, whatever nonsense that is, uh, how do you cooperate? Does it matter for you? Why cannot we just call ourselves developers, bug herders, software exorcists that just put the bugs out of the code. Like, come on. It's super easy to reduce the stress. Think about the public events that you hold in your team. How do you react when someone fails during the show and tell demo with the client? Do you support him? Do you allow him to fail? Uh, how the pull reviews, uh, pull request reviews go? Uh, how, do, how do you do all of those activities? Okay, the other thing that we can do. Uh, first of all, as a person that has the imposter around, remember to always give a feedback, honest feedback. It's not like a simple praise, you did a great job. Brilliant, yeah, like, <laughs> of course. No, just tell the person honestly, what do you think? What went good, what went bad? Don't be afraid about it. It's hard, but it helps. It, for me, it was like the most mm, helpful thing ever. We're going to get to that in a second. Second of all, tell people that there is something like this. They maybe don't know it, and it helps people to know that there's something like that. Uh, for the people with the problem, the advice from me is to keep the good feedback for the bad days. As a developer, I wasn't convinced that I'm really good because I was looking, for example, that Uncle Bob writes cleaner code, uh, Ken Beck writes more tests, stuff like that. <laughs> Neil Ford knows more about architecture. Mm, gee. <laughs> okay. Uh, but what I did, when I was joining the, my current company, I, during the interview, recognized that the guy interviewing me is quite strong. And uh, I really valued his opinion. I met him later on. And right after the interview, he just gave me the feedback, how the interview went. And for me, it's like the best feedback ever. Uh, I, whenever I doubted myself that I cannot code, I just went in my mind back to that moment. Okay, someone told me, yeah, you can do it uh, in a very pleasant way. Second thing, kill your heroes. Not literally, but think about, for example, there's Uncle Bob 
uh, writing clean code, can't back writing a lot of tests. Simon Ritter, knowing everything about Java modularity. Uh, Neil Ford and Ted Newart, they know a lot about architecture. What we often do, at least what I was constantly doing, I was merging those people as a one person, and I seen the person that I want to be. And if I'm not as good as they are at their best skills, uh, well, I considered myself a failure. So, uh, remember, Uncle Bob writes a clean code, but what the heck does he know about Oracle? Does he know more about Oracle, Oracle database uh, than you? Uh, or maybe no SQL or whatever you're doing. Remember, you're good at something and you're much better about it. Okay, uh, I like open things like open software, open definitions, that's why I use definitions from Wiki. I like open pictures, that's literally the only picture in the web that's free to use, that's uh, on Creative Commons license. So sorry if you find it offensive. But uh, learn the body language, power poses. When you're taking a lot of space, when you're feeling really well with yourself, it helps. It helps not only during the public presentations, it helps if you'll uh, check it out, if you'll do that, practice that before the meeting, for example, where you're supposed to talk. So there's a great book. Uh, Peace is the same name in English, uh, and body language will be probably the title. Okay, so uh, let's get done with the imposter thing and pass to the knowledge sharing, which is the main title of uh, the uh, presentation. So, some of you may be seen, uh, it's not the best visible, uh, that pyramid model. Uh, it comes from Andy Hand book, uh, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning, and the model shows us how we are doing on skills, and it's applicable to each skill. We can be either from novice to expert through a couple of levels. It explains the rules, how people are good and how they behave related to some of the skills. For example, I may be an expert at Java programming, but I'm novice at, I don't know, Elixir Lang or Erlang. Uh, while I'm competent at, uh, let's say, continuous integration. So, with that, I can be that senior developer uh, as a description of my profession, and I can measure various levels. Why is, why is it important? Think about your team. You will have people that are experts at front-end programming while you do back-end, while you while your code always returns one, uh, their code like, looks pretty. So imagine that suddenly you would have to work with them and they are expert and you're totally novice in CSS. How would you feel when an expert that is working based on his intuition would tell you, yeah, that's simple, just do that cascade? What the hell is cascade? Okay, so that model explains basically that people from one level shouldn't work with people down below uh, more than two hops uh, below him. So you don't put experts in the same room as, let's say, advanced beginners or novices because they need a different thing. Think about your team. Is there anyone that's better at something that you don't really like to work with when it comes to that, like checking the database or doing the front end? So it's applicable to many things. It's not like he's senior, I'm senior, we should be able to work together. It's like, think about smaller picture. Uh, the other model about knowledge, which I like more probably, is uh, the hierarchy of competence, uh, which basically says at the very bottom, the red area, are the things that you don't know that you don't know. Uh, meaning, uh, till recently, I, I don't know about a lot of stuff, and I'm not even aware that I don't know about them. Till a couple of years ago, till I met my ex-girlfriend, I didn't know that there's something called decoupage, that people put pretty butterflies from paper on boxes and sell them for a lot of money. Cool. Right now, I know it. 
So with that, I moved to the yellow area, things I know that I don't know about. I also don't know about uh, closure. I know that it exists. I know that it's a uh, language consisting from a lot of brackets, uh, parentheses, and probably something else. It's functional. That's all I know. But I'm aware that I don't know about it. So that's why it's a yellow area. Things I know that I don't know ab about. There are things that I know that I know about, which are the green part. Uh, for example, I know that I know a lot about Java. Uh, I know something about uh, continuous integration, configuring Jenkins. I could talk about it a lot. I could make a system uh, just based on my knowledge and a bit of a stack overflow. But So last part is very interesting, the blue part. Blue part is things that you don't know that you know, <laughs> meaning, uh, for example, till I met my students when, okay, because I was doing internship program uh, at my previous company, I wasn't even aware how much I know about various topics like, for example, continuous delivery. I had to talk with them to understand how much I really know. And it never occurred to me that there's like something about testing that I would be aware. Uh, and the best example to show it, in my opinion, is uh, when I was young and I barely reached over that table, I didn't know that the car exists or that I should be driving one because it helps. I was ignorant about it. I never le learned that. Then I grew a bit higher. I was able to look through the window, see the car, and think to myself, okay, that, that thing goes quite fast. I should be able to learn that one one day. And someone explained to me, oh, you need to be 18 years old in this country. Cool. Uh, I moved to the yellow area. Uh, I was aware I didn't know how to do it. Then I moved to the green area because I went for my driving test uh, and my driving school first. So the teacher told me, when you want to park a car, do something, and uh, if you want to start uh, the engine, just turn the key in the ignition, stuff like that. I learned a lot about rules, so I started to drive, and I was learning to drive constantly. And right now, let's assume that I'm an expert, uh, and I will be showing you my imposter through the talk, and I move to the blue area. So right now, if you would ask me how to park a car, I would tell you, yeah, you know, you, you're just driving and just park it right away, right? Just turn the steering wheel to the left. And you would ask me, but how, when? I remember my driving teacher told me, yeah, when you see the car on your right-hand side, between your rear view mirror and the whatever part of the door handle or something, turn the steering wheel like three times to the left, and then when you're passing him and, and you're in the middle of the other car, just turn the steering wheel two times to the right. Cool. I wouldn't be able to tell you that. I didn't know that I know about it. Why does it matter? There's a simple example. Uh, the guy in States. You know that it will be funny because it's in States. Walks into a bank and says, give me all of your money. In States, you have to handle the money if you're being robbed, because that's the law. So they gave him the money. Uh, he's not wearing a mask. He's just in his casual clothes. Uh, so he takes the money. He goes on the other side of the street, goes into the other bank, doesn't change anything, just goes to the cashier and says, give me all of, all of your money. So he takes the money and goes home. 30 minutes later, police comes, checks the videos, they see the guy, they somehow match where he went, who he is, and they go to him and knock on the door. Uh, he opens up and says, what's up? Uh, and they say, you're being arrested. And he says, why? Well, you robbed a bank. And, they, and then he asks, but how do you know? And they say, we've seen it on the video. But you couldn't see it on the video. Then the policemen are confused. Why we couldn't see it on the video? And the guy says, because I wore the juice. And they say, what? What dog? And he says, OK, you know, the uh, lemon juice is used to create the sympathetic uh, ink, so the invisible ink. So I just squeezed out a lot of lemon, rubbed it in my face, and so you weren't able to see me, right? 
Uh, first of all, the guy was just dumb, so good that they put him in jail. Second of all, he knew something, but he wasn't an expert. And that graph tells you uh, what kind of developer, if you, that's like a really long shot, but uh, that can tell you how you can optimize your knowledge. Uh, just imagine, by knowing a lot of stuff in here, in the yellow area, if you're trying to broaden your knowledge, to reduce the red area, so the things that you're ignorant about. If I know that Erlang is a programming language and it's great for uh, scalable, multi-threaded systems, and that's all I know, and I will put it somewhere in my mind, and then move on with my life, uh, back to Spring uh, and JEE. Uh, and then I will learn stuff about uh, Perl that is great for scripting, and I will put it somewhere in the bracket and just leave it there. Uh, I'm broadening the yellow area. I'm becoming the generalist. I'm able quickly to think about solution that could be possibly good for some si situation. I don't know about it, but at least I'm aware. If I move then some of the stuff into green area, I'm becoming better at it. I know how to do it, uh, but not necessarily uh, um, if I optimize mostly the green area, I can code stuff in, let's say, that spring uh, quite fast. But do I know how to do some multi-threaded systems outside of the Java world or whatever? When I move to the blue area and I focus on being expert on very little amount of things because I practice them a lot, I'm probably good, let's say, about performance. I really do well optimize Java. I write Java and bytecode. I probably can write pretty fast system, but can I write you a web application from scratch? I don't know. So that's how it helps. And that leads us to something else, which is curse of knowledge. We often, as developers, focus a lot about the people that we see on the stage. Not me particularly, but all of those great speakers that were here and downstairs before me. So you see, for example, in this room before me was Simon Ritter. You see the guy that out there standing somewhere in a long line of people between me and him. And each person in front of me knows more about Java modularity more than I do. I see him at the very beginning. Then I see Uncle Bob there that knows everything about testing. There's a long line of people that know something about testing. And each person in the line knows more. We tend to try to reach those people. And we do one mistake on the go. We never look back. And behind us, there's like the same line. We never think about people that less know, uh, that know less, <laughs> sorry. So there's a lot of people that know less about uh, testing than I do. There's probably a lot of people that know less about Java than I do, or Maven, or whatever. And it's true for everyone. So yeah, you know something, because we are going to the part where I'm going to start talking about you. You know something. Uh, you have the knowledge from your project, from your pet project, from work, from wherever, which you could share. But what I discovered uh, in the Java user group is that people usually doesn't do it. Most of the speakers, when they are coming to me saying, hey, you ask who would want to speak. Uh, well, I, I just thought that it would be cool to be on the stage and just sharing something. But I don't do anything interesting. I have nothing to tell to people. That's like, yeah, you know, my work is boring. I know nothing. I I'm pretty bad. Uh, OK. So the best example that I have is by Marius, who came to me after one of the jugs and said, you called out for speakers. Uh, here I am. And I knew Marius from before. I knew that he was working for one of the banks in Free City and that he basically created the IT department out there, the development department out there. So I knew that he will have something interesting, because as dull and boring the banks can be, there is usually something happening, because there are some standards, some unique technologies, some um, weird constraints. So we started to talk. 
And he said something about technology, like I know Spring, we are using new ESB, uh, things like that. Something about security, so we had some topics, because uh, people always want to listen about Spring, for whatever reason. Uh, so I drilled with him deeper, and I asked him, okay, so what do you do at home? Oh, you know, even more boring stuff than at work. So what is it? Well, no, no one would be interested. Okay, what the heck is that? Okay, it's that dull thing. I'm doing almost the same thing as at work. So cool. In my mind, it was like, okay, he's, he's working at bank. He's doing banking stuff at home. Is he stealing money? That would be cool. Okay, so what you are doing? Uh, well, I got that pet project. Cool. What is it doing? Oh, you know, those are the bots that are playing on Forex earning money. For me, it was jaw dropping. If you don't know what Forex is, it's like a holy grail for 90% of developers that ever learned anything about money. It's a place where a lot of countries get skimmed, like the mm, currency exchanges on a very short notices and shortening others. So it was the best session ever at the Java user group in Free City uh, with the longest QA, uh, despite it was just a flash talk. So trust me, uh, I got like more of, the, more of those talks with people. You know something, you can go and share and do it. And if you're not ready, to go on stage, even in your local community, I'm not even speaking about conferences, then start practicing on a smaller scale. Do an internship program, mentor the others. There are a lot of people, smart people in the university that were taught that objects are when you got a getter and setter. Tell them that they are wrong. Just contribute somehow. And if, if you're not fully ready for that, because students can be picky, Think about the kids. We were doing workshops for kids. Uh, I had to though, bring people that know something about kids so the kids wouldn't get hurt in the process, but you can do it. Uh, just learn them the basics of algorithms. There's a bunch of ways that you can contribute. Just share the code even, or comment someone code. Upvote the questions on Stack Overflow. That's a way of also for learning, great way for learning. Just upvote every day one good answer or one good question to something. Blog about it. Or do small events at work. More about it, because we got like 12 minutes. We'll be tomorrow in the morning. Bartek Zdanowski is in the agenda. He's talking a lot about all of those types of events. So I will just go quickly through them. Brown bags, like 15 minutes about a topic at work, during lunch, super easy. Super non-friction thing that you can implement right away. Start it. Share, share a thing that you did uh, during class sprint in your project. There's something interesting, or some other team will do it. Internal workshops, just Show them what you're doing and how. There are many ways of contributing. Public events like code retreats, hackathons, you can make them for your company or open up for a broader group. Many, many things. We also have, a, for example, at EPAM, there's a study group for BAs that practice for some weird certificate that it's really expensive that they really need. So they are just sitting together once a week, studying together, and the leader just brings the materials. Read books together. There's, it's super easy, trust me. <laughs> and things like code retreat, for example, for all of you imposters, I'm back there uh, pretending that I'm playing. That's how I'm contributing as well, because uh, I'm bad at about everything else. So. Code Retreat is a great event. It's, it's one day event. You do six sessions. The problem is known up front. You know that you will be coding six times game of life in pairs. And each time you just change a pair. You, you just change your sitting place and code with someone else. You can apply some twists to make it more interesting. Like, for example, do mute pair programming so you don't talk with one another as developers should, right? Uh, and the important thing is that after each session, you delete the code, so there is no evidence that you do, did anything, because uh, anything, this event is all about getting better. 
learning the software excellence, working with others, applying techniques that you've never seen, and they have the idea, they are bringing that to the table. Hackathons, super easy. There's a lot of that stuff happening in this country. Uh, there are groups that meet regularly just to code together. The aim of the hackathon is to just mm, take some problem, build a group, and deliver something, which is important because a lot of people, even this year, uh, which is 2016, never seen their code running on production, which is totally sad. Uh, if you were failing your whole life, maybe not you, but your projects were failing for whatever reason, not you uh, as a main reason or even a reason, but just because business somehow up, then it's really important to deliver at least once and you got the occasion there. Okay, quickly uh, towards the end, because I know that the beer is getting warmer. So, things like uh, promoting good practices, work together, code together, pair program, map, mop pair program, which means that take a beamer, put one laptop, uh, connect one laptop to that, put the whole team in front of it, and one person codes, the rest navigates, uh, if you don't like pair programming. Uh, we got uh, activity-based office, which means that you can take a laptop st stand in the middle of it and just code, because you don't have the desk assigned. You just go there and have a discussion, and this is, for example, what worked great already for my team, because we were just having a couple of meetings there, and random people just contributed some knowledge about, for example, performance testing. Super easy. Just organize a space where you can put a long standing desk, and that's it. If you can have a more space, even better. It's, it shouldn't be hard to convince your management. While working with others, it's also important to recognize them. That will be the most corporate part of the talk. <laughs> and that's because I got a great uh, team lead uh, in my team, in my project. And Bartosz thinks about uh, various stuff. Like, for example, one day he brought a brown card box. And he put into that card box a lot of candies, a lot of cans of Coke, stuff like that. And he said to everyone, hey, wait, guys, there's like a, a moment that I need from you. Uh, anyone that puts something to that box and contributes that way can take something uh, from that box and give it to someone else later on. How does it work? If someone did something great for you, you just go to the box, grab a crisps or what we got there. There's a Coke go to his desk and give it to him. It's a simple way of saying thank you if it's too hard for you to say thank you or if you're a backend developer and don't like to talk with people. Still, you can appreciate someone, promote a good behavior. And it's really important for celebrating. It builds bounds and it shows people that you care. Think about rewards inside of the team. Uh, we do very corporate things, so we recognize the best performance once a quarter. Why? Because first of all, we can say thank you to a person in some team. Second of all, we can say to the company we got the top performer, performer which means we got the best person, uh, at least for the management, it means we got the best person and you should give him some bonus. So we were able to also get some uh, bonuses for the team. Or do it on a company level. Uh, story at Ipam Gdańsk, we had the town halls when we started. And we started not so long ago, because it was just two years ago. So we had the town halls, and man management was announcing things. And it didn't work well for us, because people don't like when you make them go somewhere, right? At least most of them. Uh, so one of the guys went through all of the people in the company and asked, hey, did anything interesting happen last month? He gathered a couple of people that said yes, and he created his own town hall uh, based only on what people said that's interesting. And he called it the gathering and started to organize them each month because each month something was happening because we were either moving from office to office because uh, we were just opening the office so we had to move a lot or we were getting a lot of interesting stuff. 
So people wanted to share something. And the management looked at that initiative and they said, OK, cool. No one comes to our town halls. Everyone goes there. Can we go th uh, there as well? And he said, yeah, but pay us. And they really gave us the money. And so he organized uh, the rewards on a company level for people that contributed something to the whole office. And easy, right? We got also budgets. Uh, if, if you don't like the uh, way where you even have to take and grab something and put in on someone else's desk because it's an interaction with a human being, uh, just develop a system that will do exactly the same. So it will put a virtual badge on his profile or just thank him on Facebook. And that's like the easiest way ever. Why? Because celebrating together adds value and it leaves feedback. And it's something that people can come back to later. OK, with that, if you got any questions, I'm here for the next three days, uh, two days. And I'm here for the next four minutes, 30 seconds before I go for a beer.